government problem has been solved with government band-aid, which has been solved by government band-aid. So if you pull off government band-aid, you have three more broken band-aids underneath it that sometimes make things worse. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder or Oregonians. What you're referring is, you know what? We nice tomorrow. Everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? But nobody would put the hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. Hello, everybody. How are you all doing? This is Logan from Logan for Liberty. This show is named after me because that I am that much of a narcissist. So, without further ado, let me get through my intro. No, I screwed that up right off the bat. You should just stop watching the show. I am coming at you from the Pacific Northwest where the sun shines so bright only to rain just a few hours later. With that being said, you might have noticed that the title of this video is Liberal Conspiracy Theories. When I say liberal, I am referring to Democrats, although I am aware that Democrats aren't alone in spreading scurrilous claims. These first two stories are specifically about Democrats. Don't worry. I promptly maligned the neoconservative weekly standard in a bellicose but substantive manner. I don't need libel. These people, I, I don't need to libel these people. The, the vacuous nature of the weekly standard doesn't require an adroit rebuke. Someone with an IQ of about 82 could, without effort, tear the weekly standard to pieces. Unless you're a Democrat. They seem to be in lockstep with neocons. This lunacy has predisposed me to being more accepting of the possibility that there are indeed interdimensional child molesting demons. Alex Jones, aka the Doomslayer, is our only hope. If you're asking what I'm talking about, don't worry, it will methodically be revealed. It has something to do with our favorite topic, but I'll lead in with our more recent events involving Donald Trump's second Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh. Now, when I mean uh, liberal conspiracy theory, I'm talking about the conspiracy theory that Kamala Harris, senator from California, and um, of course... Former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton also parroted, even though it was proven false. So, I am using Reason Magazine as my source for this article. So, let's get started. California Senator Kamala Harris and other prominent Democrats distorted Brett Kavanaugh's statements on birth control and widely shared warnings that the Supreme Court nominee is a woman-hating religious extremist. Harris's comments about Kavanaugh have been deemed whoppers by Washington Post, fact-checker Glenn Kessler, and ruled as false by the lie detectors at PolitiFact. So these aren't left-wing organizations that are or at least I mean sorry these aren't predominantly right-wing organizations that are fact-checking this and have declared it false I just want to make that clear um, I will go into detail about how it is false and it does state in the article it's not just making a claim that it's false and then dropping it without adding any context Harris, who is widely considered a 2020 Democratic presidential contender, accused Kavanaugh of singling, of signaling during Senate confirmation hearings last week 
that he would be going after birth control. The Republican nominee, she tweeted, had been specifically chosen for his willingness to snatch up a woman's constitutionally protected right to make her own health care choices. Make no mistake, she warned, this is about punishing women. But the clip Harris shared as confirmation of this secret plot was deceptively edited. Asked about a case involving religious objections to the Obamacare contraception mandate, the video showed Kavanaugh responding that filling out the form would make priests for life complicit in the provision of the abortion-inducing drugs that they were, as a religious matter, objected to. Wow. Brett Kavanaugh here is saying that, uh, that he, he wants to ban abortion. He's dog whistling towards the pro-life crowd saying that he's going to ban abortion inducing drugs for women to access them from insurance companies. Oh my Lord, this, this sounds terrible, but let me continue on. Kavanaugh's use of the phrase abortion-inducing drugs is what's at issue here. The contraception mandate said that employer health insurance plans must cover birth control, not abortion pills. Harris called Kavanaugh's answer a dog whistle that showed he was against not just abortion, but also birth control. So, that is something that, uh, she... Sorry, that, that is something that we should point out here because Kamala Harris said birth control, but he said Kavanaugh in the video talked about abortion inducing drugs, which has nothing to do with abortion pills, or uh, sorry, birth control pills. Birth control is to prevent a pregnancy. Th now, there are some radical Christian fundamentalists and other religious fundamentalists, whether they're from Judaism or Islam, there are the more radical individuals that think that birth control is the same thing as abortion. But Brett Kavanaugh isn't saying that here. But Kamala Harris is saying that he is saying that. She's spreading a scurrilous claim that is completely inaccurate. And um, we'll discover why that's even more inaccurate than what is already being betrayed. The article goes on and... Um, It'll reveal a whole nother layer to why this conspiracy theory is false. Other Democrats echoed her. This is a red alarm, tweeted Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley. If you don't believe, if you didn't believe it before, believe it now. A woman's constitutional right to abortion and birth control are 100% at stake. So, um, <laughs> I'm from the Pacific Northwest, specifically Oregon. Senator Jeff Merkley is one of my senators. He's the more known senator of mine. The other one's a little quiet. No, actually, no, Ron Wyden's pretty up there. I'd say Ron Wyden's the more known one. Jeff Merkley isn't that known. I've barely ever heard him actually say anything other than his Twitter and Facebook account, which I follow, obviously, because he's my senator. But... My senator says stupid stuff like this all the time. I mean, first of all, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that women have a right to abortion. I'm not arguing whether or not they should, whether or not abortion should be legal or illegal. I am saying that if you're going to say a woman's constitutional right to abortion and birth control, you're going to have to find me where it says they have a right to abortion or birth control. Now, I will agree that they have a right to seek birth control. Never mind, that's that's uh, splitting hairs. U.S. House candidate Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted, Brett Kavanaugh doesn't even know what birth control is. He doesn't deserve to pass a 7th grade health class, let alone a Supreme Court confirmation. We must hashtag cancel Kavanaugh. So, she believes that Brett Kavanaugh shouldn't be able to pass a 7th grade health class. I believe that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez can't even pass 3rd grade language arts. Not only that, 
But uh, she needs to take a newspaper class or an ethical journalist class somewhere. So, you know, so she doesn't parrot out these ridiculous conspiracy theories. And I will explain why it is a conspiracy theory even more than I already did. But here's what Harris left off the start of the abortion-inducing drug sentence in her video clip. They said Kavanaugh's full sentence has been that. They said filling out the form would make them complicit in the provision of the abortion-inducing drugs that they were, as a religious matter, objecting to. So he's talking about his constituents, or his client would be the more appropriate word. Brett Kavanaugh, sorry, my voice cracked. Don't watch this show. Brett Kavanaugh, representing his client, which is the Priests for Life, felt that they were complicit in abortion because they had to... I'll, I'll continue, I'll continue. But let's just make that clear that Brett Kavanaugh wasn't saying that he was against these abortion-inducing drugs or that filling out the form would make them complicit in the provision of abortion-inducing drugs. Rather, he was saying that's what his clients believed. So that is why this is a conspiracy theory, and it it's, gets even worse. In other words, Kavanaugh was characterizing the positions of Priest for Life plaintiffs in the lawsuit which he had specifically been asked about. In 2015, Kavanaugh had dissented from other U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit judges who had denied priests for life's request for full court hearing after a three-judge panel rejected their claims. In his dissent, Kavanaugh writes that the Supreme Court's ruling in the Hobby Lobby case strongly suggests that the government has a compelling interest in facilitating access to contraception for the employees of these religious organizations. However, the government need not, and therefore under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, may not pursue its compelling interest in facilitating access to contraception by requiring religious nonprofit organizations to submit the form required by current federal regulations. One note for clarity, Kavanaugh said, the government may, of course, continue to require the religious organizations and insurers to provide contraceptive coverage to the religious organization's employees, even if the religion's obje organizations object. As Judge Flom correctly explained, the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act does not authorize religious organizations to dictate the independent actions of third parties, even if the organization sincerely disagrees with them. When called out about the short and clipped, Harris pressed on with original criticism. There is no question that he uncritically used the term abortion-inducing drugs, which is a dog-whistle term used by extreme anti-choice groups to describe birth control, she tweeted. This is a pattern with Harris. When called out on bad behavior, she doubles down. And then Reason Magazine uh, links to five articles about Ka Kamala Car Harris sorry, being an insane conspiracy theory parroting psycho, almost, pretty much. In any event, it looks like we're gearing up for a full rehash of the war on women rhetoric we saw in the late Obama years. And so far, it's promising to be every bit as dumb. And just so we're clear, this article is written by a woman named Elizabeth Nolan Brown. And um, if you know anything about Elizabeth Nolan Brown, she is... She's not against women's rights in any way whatsoever. She believes that women ought to be as free as possible. Now, I don't know Elizabeth Nolan's Brown Brown's position on birth control, but let me do a quick search on her because she she works for Reason magazine and she is rather she she's I would say she's kind of a feminist, not like the the fourth wave, fourth wave or third wave 
feminist, but so of course she is an associate editor at Reason. Elizabeth Nolan Brown is an associate editor at Reason, where she covers criminal justice, politics, and policy with a special focus on the intersection of sex, speech, technology, and law. She has won multiple awards for her coverage of these issues including the 2016 Western Publishing Association Award for Best Investigative Feature and for Southern Carolina Journalism Awards. So, in a way, I would say she's kind of a feminist in that way. She's open about sex. I, mean, I, I think most adults are. But she's not an anti-feminist is how I would describe it. She's just, she's reasonable and she doesn't buy rhetoric. So let's continue on. Let's talk about our favorite person, Hillary Clinton. The one that should have won the presidential election. Because, well, Hillary Clinton is the master, is the best. So, in recent weeks, prominent Democrats have cheered the banning of conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. This article is also written by Elizabeth Nolan Brown from social platforms and have floated proposals for regulating the dissemination of foreign ads and hash, sorry, quote unquote fake news. At the time, they have gleefully spread conspiracy theories and falsehoods about Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. The late lunacy comes courtesy of none other than Hillary Clinton, who today tweeted out talking points popularized by Senator Kamala Harris, Democrat from California. Talking points that mainstream and nonpartisan fact checkers have labeled false. Harris had shared a video clip in which Kavanaugh appears to be referring to birth control pills as abortion inducing drugs. The video was edited to lead the part that makes it clear that Kavanaugh was not expressing his own views, but was describing the position taken by the plaintiffs in a case he had ruled on. Harris and now Clinton, our favorite presidential candidate in the history of ever, Use this as supposed evidence that Kavanaugh is a zealot who wants to ban birth control. Kavanaugh's own words on the issue not only include no such indication, but also recognize a compelling interest in ensuring access to birth control. Kavanaugh has also written that while society should accommodate religious objections to participating in the provision of contraception, those religious beliefs could not be used to justify restricting the actions of others. And it basically goes to the same quote where Brett Kavanaugh says that the government should not interfere between an insurance company and an employee or a, an individual, even if the employee objects. But if the employee is seeking health coverage through an organization, then the organization has a right not to be complicit or ha has the right to not also include contraception or abortion inducing drugs <clears throat> that's what i was going to say last time when i was reading the last article but i didn't say it clearly well i didn't finish it i continued yet no amount of plain evidence can counter the dog whistles that democrats think or pretend to think they're hearing kavanaugh didn't use the term abortion inducting drugs because he misunderstands the basic science of birth control, said Clinton. So far, so good, but rather than explain that Kavanaugh was using the language of the plaintiffs in the case he had specifically been asked about, Clinton claims he used the term because it's a dog whistle to the extreme right, signaling that legal abortion isn't the only fundamental reproductive right at grave risk if he is confirmed. Access to birth control is too, from their Clinton conjures, an eminent world where doctors are criminalized for providing birth control pills. We saw the same mysticism on display at the start of the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings last week when his assistant's resting hand position, and I love that Elizabeth Nolan Brown is bringing this up, hand position and use of what appeared to be the OK symbol had prominent progressives seriously warning that Kavanaugh was beholden to white supremacists. <clears throat> Which, by the way, this whole thing is a 4chan prank. 
from 2017. The the okay hand gesture being a white supremacist thing. And uh, nutbags have fallen for it. And yeah, let's just say that was a thing that also got spread around. And that took on a metastasis of its own. When a half-Jewish person whose parents escaped the Holocaust was do was resting her arm and it looked like she was making an okay sign behind Brett Kavanaugh. Because she was taking this moment to signal to the white supremacist that, yeah, she's on their side. Could you... Could you imagine that for just um, just just think about it for a second? <clears throat> you're sitting there, you're a white supremacist, you're a half Jewish white supremacist whose parents escaped from the Holocaust. But nonetheless, you're sitting there and you know you're secretly hiding that you're a white supremacist, right? So you think that you're going to all you're, you think that you're going to dog whistle to the white supremacists out there. I go, yeah, here's my chance, this really secretive signal to the white supremacist that everybody knows. Just imagine how insane that sounds. Like, that alone legitimizes Alex Jones' conspiracy theory of interdimensional child molesting demons. I mean, it doesn't, it's so bizarre. Most white supremacists are proud of being white supremacists. They're not going to go, oh yeah, let's do this hand signal. I'm here, brothers. I'm here, believe me. Anyway, just yesterday, the progressive outlet Think Progress was outraged that the push to censor fake news on Facebook had netted their content even though the headline of said content referenced Kavanaugh's statements that do not exist. The headline claimed that Kavanaugh said he would kill Roe v. Wade, but almost no one noticed. No one noticed, of course, because he didn't actually say that or anything like it. And no amount of reading into his comments on legal precedent can justify claiming someone said something when they did not. Depending on your perspective, all this may seem infuriating, amusing, or just like business as usual. But it's certainly bad for the reality-based dialogue, the civility and the transparency that Democrats claim to want, and that they slag Republicans for failing to uphold. If politics is turning into a toxic sludge of disinformation and paranoia, both major parties share the blame. There are enough concrete things in Kavanaugh's record to be wary of, and plenty of people in the federal government gearing up to erode women's equality, consumer choice, and the rights and power of minorities without invoking Margaret Atwood novels or the Illuminati. But conspiracy theories and propaganda seem to sell and to bring in donations better than mere facts can. So Democrats are choosing to wallow in this disgusting swamp right alongside their hashtag Make America Great Again counterparts, or MAGA, as it's written. So, as Elizabeth Nolan Brown mentioned in the article, this isn't the first time that liberals, or Democrats in this case, have resorted to using conspiracy theories. I'm glad that she brought that up, because I was going to bring that up on my own, but that's just one nail in the coffin. You see, Hillary Clinton termed the word vast right-wing conspiracy and there's even uh, fast let me look this up real quick sorry i'm taking like little breaks fast right -wing conspiracy there's a word that uh that goes with it fast right wing Okay, there, there, there was a phrase. Oh yeah, uh, Velox. Yeah, I think it's a uh, Velox conspiracy. Yeah, the Velox conspiracy. That's funny. So there's even uh, the Velox conspiracy, which is a blog which was founded in 2002 covering legal and political issues from an ideological orientation it describes as generally a libertarian, conservative, centrist, or some mixture of these. 
its name is a joking reference to Hillary Clinton's reference to a vast right-wing conspiracy. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, this isn't the first time that Democrats have accused right-wingers of being conspiracy theorists, which in turn has actually made them conspiracy theorists because if you're inaccurately dismissing criticism from the right or making something up about the right and calling them a conspiracy theory when there is no evidence, doesn't that make you a conspiracy theorist? Now, don't get me wrong, I personally think that conspiracy theories have their place because oftentimes, not, I don't, I don't want to say oftentimes, I shouldn't have put that word in there, but sometimes a conspiracy theory turns out to actually be a conspiracy. So, not only do we have this new made-up event that never happened where Brett Kavanaugh was talking about how uh, abortion inducting drugs uh, threaten religious liberty and how he was dog whistling, which is one of their favorite terms to use, dog whistling. And dog whistling is basically saying, oh, we don't have proof that this person actually believes this, but because this person is using a specific term that is used by group B or white supremacists, therefore they're dog whistling. They did this back when Ronald Reagan was president. And Ronald Reagan has his problems from my perspective because he didn't actually do a lot of what he said he believed in. Uh, in his inauguration speech, I don't remember which one, but he said that the states gave the federal government their power, not the other way around. In other words, Ronald Reagan was talking about states' rights or states' power. He was talking about constitution, American constitutional federalism. But you know what he got accused of back then? Dog whistling to neo-confederates because states' rights is a dog whistle to racists who want to bring back segregation. But if you read Ronald Reagan's speech or any of his words, Never once did he talk about wanting to bring back segregation through state power. It's it's a ridiculous thing. That's also not the only example. Um, we also have the whole Russia Gate scandal. I hate the word gate because you know Watergate, Pizza Gate, Christ Almighty. Um. So I have an article here from the Weekly Standard, which is a neoconservative article, but this is basically the same thing that Democrats are promoting, basically, that uh, there's, or, or so if, type in Ron, Rand Paul on Twitter, and you'll see nonstop articles and people calling Rand Paul a Russian stooge, because... <clears throat> Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, Republican of Kentucky, has been supporting Donald Trump's moves on Russia for the most part, wanting to open dialogue. And so, well, I have two completely contrasting articles. I have one from Reason Magazine, and I have one from the Weekly Standard. And I know the Weekly Standard is technically a conservative news organization, but as I said earlier in sort of the beginning... Neoconservatives and Democrats are in lockstep together. They're, Democrats are not anti-war. They're, they're pretty much pro-war. They would love a war with Russia. But, without further ado, let's, let's analyze this. So, if you read the Weekly Standard, they, the title is Rand Paul, Russian Stooge, which is, by the way, what left-wingers have been calling Rand Paul in lockstep with the neoconservatives who are pro-war. And the article basically goes on to say that, uh, um, what does it say? Oh, it says that Rand Paul is inconsistent, uh, that he was wrong to, it, it doesn't really say anything. I guess I'll read it, kind of, some of it, and then analyze it. Because it's a, a kind of a long article, so I'll read sections of it. So the 
I don't know what you'd call it. The not not the headline title, but the title below it. I don't know what you'd call it. What does the kooky libertarian see in the authoritarian Putin regime? So you know this is written by a neocon because only neocons call us kooky libertarians. Senator Rand Paul has been making the rounds in recent days touting deeper U.S. engagement with Vladimir Putin's Russia. It's often the case when Senator Paul talks about foreign policy, his pronouncements are a curious admixture of odd conspiracy theories, pacifist banalities, and ahistorical analogies all delivered without, with the confidence condescension, sorry, condescension of someone who doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. And of course, when he says conspiracy theories, he doesn't link to anything that shows what conspiracy he's talking about. And if you think he's going to explain any conspiracy theories later on in the article, this person doesn't. And by the way, this is Stephen F. Hayes, who is editor-in-chief at the Weekly Standard. But this is the garbage-tier crap that we get from the editor-in-chief from the Weekly Standard. And he also gets offended that Rand Paul talks about Neocon in this article. So, yeah, odd conspiracy theories. He doesn't explain any conspiracy theories whatsoever. And of course, being a pacifist is somehow bad. Although I wouldn't call Rand Paul a pacifist. I'd call him a realist saying, hey, uh, and actually he's quoted in the Reason article, which is completely contrasted from the Weekly Standard. As you can imagine, Reason Magazine being a libertarian-leaning magazine aren't going to be proponents of war. So they're obviously going to have a more positive bent on people who want to avo avoid war. Um, Ron Paul, sorry, Ron, Rand Paul is quoted saying in a pre press conference call responding to critics about, you know, his siding with Donald Trump on negotiating with Russia and talking to Russia. I think it is important that we have dialogue between countries that control 90% of nuclear weapons in the world. Does that sound like pacifism to you? Or does that sound like realism? Do you know what nuclear bombs do, Stephen F. Hayes? Do you know what they do? Well, depending on whether or not it's a hydrogen bomb or an atom bomb, they literally explode the air, incinerate anything caught in ground zero, and then spread radiation for miles and make that specific area uninhabitable for a long, extended period of time. The amount of destruction that nuclear weapons cause is unbelievable. And you can bet your ass that if the United States and Russia ever went to war with each other, and one of them felt deeply threatened as if they were no longer going to be on the face of the earth, you can guarantee it will lead into a nuclear war. Not only that, but can anybody in history can anybody name me one time in history where two nuclear powers actually fought face to face in conventional warfare? Probably not, because it's so rare. I'm almost confident to say that it hasn't ever happened. Because when two nuclear powers have nuclear bombs, they don't go to war. There's a reason why we haven't invaded Iran, but rather we've invaded Iraq, we've invaded Afghanistan, Pakistan, all these countries that don't have nuclear weapons. There's a reason why we haven't invaded North Korea because of the prospect that they have nuclear weapons and because they're sort of allied with Russia who has nuclear weapons. Sorry, that was kind of a rant. I, I felt like I had to talk. Anyway, so it is with Paul's lonely effort to provide intellectual backing for Donald Trump's instinctive desire to make nice with the increasingly provocative regime run by the anti-American former KGB agent. So what about the United States? Is the United States not anti-Russia? Are they not anti-old Soviet agents? Is the United States not provocative? Weren't, weren't, wasn't the United States government funding rebels to take down Syria, which was a direct threat not only to Russia's national security, but Russia's oil interests? And by the way, these rebels had more in common with ISIS than they did with our interests. The only thing that... Than uh, the American American government's interests. I need to pipe down a little bit. I see myself getting triggered. Because to me it's just so blatantly obvious. But these neocons. They have no perspective or any nuance looking at these situations. 
Examples of Paul's foolishness are legion, but the most revealing came from an interview that the senator conducted on August 16, 2018 with the Liberty Report, an internet television show hosted by his father, Liberty Gadfley, and former Congressman Ron Paul. Senator Paul has lately made a cause of conciliation by concession, seeking to reverse sanctions on Russian lawmakers, blocking proposed sanctions on Russian oil interests, and more broadly preventing punitive measures on Putin's Russia. In favor of dialogue and conversation, these efforts build on his past work downplaying Putin's aggression and attacking those who highlight it. In late February 2014, with Russian troops on high alert and amassed on the border with Ukraine, Paul spoke out not against the Russian strongman who had put them there, but against conservatives who warned about Putin's expansionism and the possibility of an imminent invasion. Quote, Some on our side are so stuck in the Cold War era that they want to tweak Russia all the time, and I don't think that is a good idea, he said, for good measure. He echoed Russian propaganda messaging at the time that, quote, Ukraine has a long history of being, you know, either part of the Soviet Union or within that sphere. Common language, Electra. So I don't think it behooves us to tell Ukraine what to do. Okay, so first of all, it's apparently Russian propaganda to say that we shouldn't tell Ukraine what to do. But we shouldn't tell Ukraine what to do. They are their own country. If, if, if they want to have relations with Russia, that is their business. But it's not our duty to do that. And not only that, but the article that he is referencing is an article that Rand Paul wrote in 2014 when he was gearing up for the presidential election. And if, you can go and you can read that article, by the way. In the article... He took one quote in the article saying that, yeah, we probably shouldn't go to war with Russia. But he states, without actually quoting any way that Rand Paul is downplaying Putin's expansionism, Rand Paul says that if I was president, I would put sanctions on them. We should condemn them. And we should, we should come out strong against Russia strongmanning Ukraine. But Stephen F. Hayes, the neocon, doesn't say that because it would go against the narrative that he's trying to paint here. That Rand Paul is a pacifist. Which, by the way, I would rather Rand Paul not put sanctions on Russia. And it seems as if, over the four years after he wrote that article, of course, Rand Paul has changed his mind for the better. But without further ado, Stephen F. Hayes is a liar. He is lying through his fingers, man. I would say through his teeth, but this is text. Is it any wonder then that Senator Paul has welcomed with open arms by Putin's allies on his recent trip to Russia? Not really. Oh, why? Because he said we shouldn't interfere, interfere with Ukraine-Russian relations? It's no wonder that the Russians like Rand Paul. This is a joke of an article. But Paul nonetheless sounded surprised when he told his father... He had been lucky enough to get meetings with Russian law lawmakers. Paul reported that while he doesn't take everything he's told as the unalloyed truth, he found that Russian legislators are more open to dialogue and want to meet and do want better relations with the United States. He told his father that his travels in Russia made it clear to him that while most Russians today might not find things perfect, they prefer life under Vladimir Putin to the old Soviet Union and the difficult time of the crazy Wild West 1990s that followed the dissolution of the Soviet bloc. Senator Paul recounted for his father a meeting he'd had with the head of the Libertarian Party of Russia, who the younger Paul reported has been getting crowds of 10 to 20 to 30,000 people to show up to hear the libertarian message in Russia. It's not perfect. He's not allowed on the ballot there, Senator Paul explained, but at least he was able to speak with us while we were there. So, uh, that sounds like a pretty reasonable thing to say, that, uh, you know, most Russians want peace. They they don't like what happened during the Cold War, especially the break, the ending of the Cold War when the Soviet Union broke up. And he's also saying that there there is a libertarian, which is basically anti-war individualist sort of group, 
that exists within Russia, at least 10 to 30,000, which isn't perfect, but at least they're able to speak. So then what does Stephen F. Hayes have to respond to that? It's not perfect, might qualify as an understatement, as Putin's government rather routinely targets for assassination at home and abroad. His political opponents, real and perceived, may be... Such understatement is part of Paul's determined effort to avoid tweaking Russia all the time. Wow, that is such a wild thing to say. There's nothing wrong with saying, yeah, at least they're able to speak, but God, Stephen F. Hayes takes issue with it because Vladimir Putin usually executes or imprisons his political opponents. Okay, what is... What does that have to do with anything? No, seriously, what does that have to do with anything? You should be celebrating that there are 10 to 30,000 people who are able to show up and talk about freedom, talk about individualism, talk about escaping tyranny, which apparently Stephen F. Hayes says that he hates. He says that Vladimir Putin is this tyrannical person who's extremely provocative but when Rand Paul is saying hey you know what it's kind of good that there were 10 to 30 thousand people of the libertarian party of Russia who don't have ballot access but they're still able to talk about their ideas freely and openly Stephen F. Hayes has to say well that's an understatement it's not perfect but you know Vladimir Putin has a history of killing his opponents yeah that's wrong but at least these people are able to speak. But you take issue with it only because Rand Paul is saying it. And because you're a neoconservative who is pro-war, therefore anti-individualist. I don't care. Listen, I'm going to say something rather, rather up front. I'm going to be blatant. I'm going to be straightforward. I'm going to make a strong statement that I feel is true. If you are a neoconservative, conservative, if you are pro-war, you are not an individualist. You are only an individualist at home. But abroad, you do not care about anybody else's well-being. You are willing to kill people overseas for benign reasons. Did I use that word right? I hope I used that word right. Because then it would make my rant, if I used the word wrong, would make my rant pathetic? <laughs> Embarrassing? Without further ado, Paul acknowledges that Russia probably interfered with the 2016 election, but he downplays this meddling as inconsequential while offering the kind of absurd framing for which Kennedy's junior senator has become famous. <clears throat> so, <laughs> Stephen F. Hayes is hilarious, this neoconservative slash Democrat. By the way, just to make things clear, neoconservatives generally came from the Democratic Party. They fled the Democratic Party and joined the Republican Party. So, let's be clear about that. Not that Republicans are, you know, good or anything. But if the Republican Party was in the mold of Rand or Ron Paul, they'd be better. Without further ado, so Stephen F. Hayes tries to say that Rand Paul agreed that Russia interfered with the election, which he made no such thing, which is extremely bizarre that... He goes on to quote Rand Paul saying, Do I think that they probably hacked into Hillary Clinton's emails? Yes. But they are never ever going to admit that. But if I were to weigh hacking into Hillary Clinton's emails with nuclear war, they sort of pale in comparison. So, hacking into Hillary Clinton's emails is not interfering with the election. Interfering with the election would be changing votes. So yes, Rand Paul is going to downplay that because... Why, why don't we talk about the content of the emails that Russia probably hacked into? Should Can we go over that? You want to talk about corruption? But is corruption only a bad thing when it's overseas? But when it's domestic, oh, psh, well, oh, you mean a foreign government hacked it? We'll ignore the information that was revealed to us. And it's, path I'm not a fan of Russia. I do, think, I do think we should have open dialogue with them and be friends with them because that's what any sane person who doesn't want to die or see other people die would say. But it's rather insane to be pissed off at a foreign government 
which revealed to you, did you a favor, and showed you that this person running in your presidential election was the most corrupt person possible. Have you heard Hillary Clinton's rhetoric? She wanted war with Russia. And Rand Paul's right. They're never going to admit that. And Hillary Clinton's emails with nuclear war, it is a huge contrast. These things don't even make sense. Choose one. Do you want somebody to hack a corrupt person in your election and reveal to the public what they should have known already, the secrecy and corruption of the Democratic Party? Or do you want to go out with fire and fury from a nuclear blast. Not even fury. Fire and patheticness. I don't know what the right word would be. You're basically an ant underneath a magnifying glass. You're done. That's it. You're done. So yeah. If, uh, you, if you had me pull a lever between... Having a foreign government hack Hillary Clinton's emails to reveal how corrupt the Democratic Party was versus nuclear war. I'm going to pull the lever of the foreign government hacking Hillary Clinton's emails to show how corrupt she was. Every time. <clears throat> so what does Stephen F. Hayes have to say about that? Either we let Russia's hacking slide or we have nuclear war. It's, kind of, it's the kind of logic that leads to arguments like the one Paul offers as a follow-up. <clears throat> In rapid succession, the senator says that A, sanctions on Russia haven't done any good and poison relations, and B, the reaction to Russia meddling in our elections include the sanctions have made it clear to them that their continued meddling in our elections would harm U.S.-Russia relations, and C, sanctions on Russia will have the opposite of their intended effect. Um... You could try to put sanctions on Russia and punish them, but their response is to become more firm in their resolve not to do something, Paul explained, like election meddling in all likelihood. Yes, Russia probably did hack Hillary Clinton's emails. I don't think they expected the reaction in our country or how big deal it would become, but I think they're seeing now that if they did this, it's backfired on them. <clears throat> um, so, that seems pretty reasonable to me, but Stephen... F. Hayes is going to try to say that there's a contradiction within what Rand Paul is saying. Why have they come to this conclusion in large part because of U.S. sanctions and other punitive measures? He concentrates on that because he's saying that Rand Paul said that sanctions don't work. And then says, oh, well, it does work because you clearly stated that the Russians have learned their lesson and have learned that a U.S. response would be rather harsh because... Of sanctions. Rand Paul is not saying that sanctions won't send a message. Rand Paul is saying that sanctions will send a message to Russia that will only hurt our relations later on down the line. But he's ignoring that to say, well, why have they come to this conclusion without taking anything else that Rand Paul said? into consideration all this this person checked out on sanctions on Russia haven't done any good he's not saying sanctions haven't done anything he is stating that sanctions haven't done any good and they haven't because they have harmed US Russia relations Stephen F Hayes has an IQ of 81 and he doesn't seem to be able to grasp nuance Ideas, which to me, this isn't even nuanced. This is rather straightforward. Yeah, putting sanctions on somebody. Is it going to do any good? <clears throat> They've got worse relations, less dialogue, less trade, more sanctions. And so I think it's important for Russia to understand what's going on in our country. And I think some of it is hysteria in our country in order for them to decide because countries have the ability to spy and will continue to spy and countries that have the ability to hack into computers will continue to do this. What we need to do is make sure they understand that if they want better relations, that it's not in their best interest. They're annoyed with the sanctions, but they'll actually resist change more with the sanctions. And then Stephen F. Hayes says, in short, sanctions don't work. Sanctions have worked here, but sanctions won't work in the future. 
If logic isn't Senator Paul's strength, neither is history. In arguing for leaning... Okay, so we'll, we'll go on that. But that's not what Rand Paul is saying at all. He didn't say sanctions don't work. And that sanctions have worked here, but sanctions won't work in the future. That's not what he's saying at all. He's not saying sanctions haven't worked. Sanctions have worked. Sanctions have worked in telling Russia that, hey, we did not approve of this action. But it's still making things worse between U.S. and Russia. Logic is not Stephen F. Hayes' strong point. <clears throat> I mean, I could go through the quote, and nothing will Rand Paul say that indicates that sanctions don't work. <laughs> At all. I went on long enough. I just wanted to kind of touch on that. To show you the logic that these people are coming from, they are trying hard, extremely hard, to overlook any sort of logic or any sort of... um. On the appropriate response to the Russia situation. Because in their mind, we should absolutely try to punish Russia. No, we shouldn't. Unless... <sighs> That's the same type of logic. I hate to go down this path. Saying that we should punish Russia for hacking Hillary Clinton's emails is the same thing as saying that Osama bin Laden should have punished us with 9-11 because we were interfering in the Middle East. It's the same thing, and I'm going to leave you on that note. Thanks for watching.